Well, if you have a Bible with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open it to uh, Acts chapter 15. Uh, we have been, uh, we've spent the last couple of weeks actually camped out in chapter 15 of the book of Acts, and we've spent most of that time focused on the controversy that was faced by the early church. That controversy, if you remember, centered around whether or not these new Gentile Christians were required to keep the law of Moses and to get circumcised. Uh, And I left sort of one small sliver out of uh, chapter 15 that we haven't yet talked about. And the reason for that is because I think it's worth exploring uh, that on its own. I entitled last week's message, The Gospel and Compromise, and I entitled this week's message, The Gospel and Conflict. And the reason for that title is because this passage centers around a conflict that arose between Paul and Barnabas. So let me go ahead and read it for you. We're in Acts chapter 15, and we're looking today at verses 36 to 41. Here's what it says. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Well, it's just a short passage, but I think there's lots in this passage that is instructive for us, and we're going to zoom in on the issue of conflict this morning. I really just have two things to say. The first thing is to just say that conflict is inevitable, And the second thing is to say that conflict is redeemable. So let me start with the inevitable part. And my expanded point is that conflict is inevitable even in the church. Now, if you've been around church long enough, you know that to be true. Uh, Some of you might even think that the second half of that statement is not strong enough. Maybe I should have said conflict is inevitable, especially in the church. I mean, it happens. People have disagreements. Sometimes they have sharp disagreements. And when those disagreements are sharp enough, they go their separate ways. Sometimes others get involved, and sometimes entire churches are split as a result. So you've probably heard the story of the the man who was rescued from a deserted island where he had survived alone for 15 years. And when his rescuers arrived, he gave them a tour of the little sort of one-man town that he had constructed throughout the course of those 15 years. And he explained, well, that was my house. Over there was the store that I built. Uh, This building was a kind of cabana. And over here in this building is where I go to church. And then one of the rescuers said, well, what's that building right beside that building? He said, well, that's where I used to go to church. <clears throat> right, that is sometimes too true, isn't it? I know I've talked with some of you who have experienced things like church splits or broken relationships with those you used to fellowship with. Lots of people can identify with a situation where a disagreement led to the breaking of a relationship or the breaking of trust in a relationship or even the end of a relationship, even a relationship that was at one time close. And I think it's good to acknowledge that those sorts of things happen in the life of the church as well. And we're going to get into the specifics of this conflict between Paul and Barnabas, but maybe it's good uh, just to say a couple of things about Christians and conflict, or the gospel and conflict first. 
And I would just say that there are different types of conflict. There is a good kind of conflict. Uh, Some people don't like conflict of any kind, right? They are conflict averse or conflict avoiders. And sometimes that means that they just kind of look the other way or don't say anything as a way to keep the peace, even in situations where conflict is warranted or necessary. Now, we've already seen that there is a good type of conflict, we, that there's a need for conflict at times. We saw it earlier in this chapter. There's a place to stand up and say, you're wrong, what you're teaching is dangerous, right? This is what we saw at the beginning of, of chapter 15. Verses 1 and 2 say this, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Now, we went over this a couple of weeks back, but when these men showed up preaching a salvation by works, you have to do this in order to be saved, it says that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. And what that really means is that they had lots of dissension and debate with them. So it's important to know that that kind of conflict is necessary at times. Sometimes in our Canadian politeness, or maybe in our misguided thinking that Christians are supposed to just tolerate everything, We don't do what Paul and Barnabas did here. We don't contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Now, I'm not talking about being nitpicky or being hypercritical, but when the truth of the gospel is at stake, we better be prepared and ready to engage in conflict. Now, we might say yes to all of that, but we might think, well, you know, that kind of direct sort of in-your-face conflict is reserved just for the false teachers, those who are openly hostile to the message of the gospel or are perverting it in one way or another. In actual fact, though, even some of the sort of intramural stuff within the church requires us to engage in conflict at times, and that's not always a bad thing. The Apostle Paul was a bit of a model for us in that. So apart from this conflict uh, with the false teachers at the start of Acts 15, we read about another public conflict that Paul had. And we read about this one in the book of Galatians. Paul said this, he said, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Right? That's almost shocking, right? I mean, this is Peter. And he's living in the fear of man. And Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Now, in this case, it's clear. Paul was right and Peter was wrong. And again, there is a place for this kind of conflict. It is healthy even. We might not like to be challenged or to have someone oppose us. We might not like to challenge others or to oppose them. But when a Christian leader is acting hypocritically, it is right and proper to confront them. I mean, we've all heard about the dangers of, you know, celebrity pastors How some of these people, because of, you know, fame or whatever, started acting like tyrants, kind of living like they're above the law. And whenever they do sort of post-mortems on ministries that fell apart because of that sort of thing, it always becomes clear that along the way, no one was willing to tell that individual when they were wrong. No one was willing to challenge them. No one was willing to say, you know what, you're not acting in accord with the gospel. So that's a good kind of conflict. There is also a bad kind of conflict. Now, we've all heard stories of churches that split over disagreements, over, you know, like the, car- the color of the carpet and the like. I don't, I don't know if that's just sort of urban legend, but, you know, there are those types of conflicts. 
Someone gets offended over a minor thing, and before you know it, there is a major conflict with people feeling like they need to take sides. That's a bad kind of conflict. But that's not exactly what I mean here. I would say that sometimes the kind of conflict that happens in the church happens because some people actually like conflict. They thrive on it. They don't really feel like they're alive unless they're embroiled in some controversy or conflict. I'm sure I've told you before about doing counseling with one couple where the husband said, That part of the problem he and his wife were having was that she argued with him all the time about everything. And and you know what she said? No, I don't. Look, Look, there are people like that. I think the technical name for them is likes to fight guy. You know the type of person I'm talking about. They're always looking for a fight. They're ready to throw hands at the drop of a hat. And sometimes those people show up at church. They want to argue about everything. They bring division wherever they go. Now, Paul counseled both Timothy and Titus about these types of individuals and these types of conflicts. Here's what Paul said to Titus. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. So that is a, a bad type of conflict. Paul says, look, Don't waste your breath and don't waste your time. And he basically said the same thing to Timothy. He said, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, right? So I think we would do well in the church to heed Paul's counsel about this. There's a good type of conflict. There is a bad type of conflict. But there's also a third type of conflict or category of conflict, and I would label it as a puzzling kind of conflict. And what I mean by that is that there is a kind of conflict where it's not necessarily easy to say, you know, this person is in the right and this person is in the wrong. And that's the kind of conflict we find here in Acts chapter 15. The conflict here centered around whether or not John Mark should accompany Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. Verse 39 tells us that there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Now, in one sense, it's kind of a surprising conflict, don't you think? Or it's kind of surprising that the conflict got to this point where they had to go their separate ways. They had to separate from one another. I mean, the conflict didn't arise over any kind of wonky teaching. It wasn't a a character issue that prompted this. All through the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are spoken of favorably, at least after Paul's conversion. We were first introduced to Barnabas back in chapter 4 with these words. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet, right? Barnabas is a generous guy, He's known as the son of encouragement, and all through the book of Acts, he lives up to his name as the son of encouragement. He's always encouraging others. Elsewhere in the book of Acts, Barnabas is described like this. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all. 
to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. That's Barnabas, always encouraging others, always exhorting them, stay faithful to the Lord. It says here he was a good man, he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Barnabas seems like the kind of guy that it would be easy to get along with. It seems like he, is, he was always ready to believe the best about people. Listen to what we read about Paul and Barnabas shortly after Paul's conversion. And when he, that's Paul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, right? Everyone knew about Paul's past persecution of the church. Everyone was afraid of him except Barnabas. Barnabas steps in and he brings Paul before the apostles and he says, no, no, he's a genuine disciple. He's out here boldly preaching in the name of Jesus. We ought to welcome him. And ever since that point, Paul and Barnabas seemed inseparable. I mean, you read lots about Barnabas and Paul or Paul and Barnabas. Just a couple of chapters back in chapter 13, we read that the Lord said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And they completed a successful ministry or missionary journey together. They fought off the false teachers together. But now, they're in conflict. So what was this conflict about? What led to this sharp disagreement and them separating from each other? Well, we're told specifically in verses 37 and 38. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So this went back to their first missionary journey together. And that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 13. And there it says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, And came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. We're not told specifically why John Mark left them. Was he homesick? Was the nature of the work harder than he imagined? We don't know exactly. But the word used here in chapter 15 for his departure from them that he withdrew from them, is actually the word for desertion. So John Mark deserted them or abandoned them in the middle of their mission. And Paul was not happy about it. He wasn't about to take him along on the next trip. And you can understand that. I mean, if you had an employee who didn't complete the task that you gave them, you would be reluctant to give them another task. I mean, they might even just be out the door. You're going to think twice about it, for sure. So I think a lot of us might look at this conflict and then conclude, well, look, I mean, I'm on Team Paul. Like, I wouldn't have taken John Mark either. But it's also possible to see things from Barnabas' perspective. Now, remember, Barnabas is known as the son of encouragement, right? He looks for the good in people. He wants to give John Mark a second chance. On top of that, John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. And we know that from Colossians chapter 4. So Barnabas might have some insights into John Mark that Paul doesn't have or didn't have. And so some of you might be on Team Barnabas. You might think, well, look, I mean, people deserve second chances. They just need the right sort of environment to succeed. And 
Honestly, we can understand both of these perspectives, I think. This type of conflict is common. It's not always clear that there is a right and a wrong answer to a given question or a given situation. Sometimes this kind of conflict happens, yes, even between brothers and sisters, and we don't really know what to make of it. So in the book of Philippians, we read about a conflict like this. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 4. As Paul is writing to the church, he says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There was some type of conflict between these two women. And Paul had to write to church and say, help them. Now, we don't know who or what caused it. What we do know is that these women are described as those who labored side by side in the work of the gospel. But now, there's something between them. And I just want to say that this type of conflict is a reality even in the life of the church. People disagree about philosophy of ministry or the way a given situation should be handled. And it's not always easy to conclude this person is in the right and this person is in the wrong. Now, something like that happened in London in the 1960s. At that time, the two most prominent evangelical leaders in London were Martin Lloyd-Jones and John Stott. Now, I've quoted from both of those men numerous times from this pulpit, but they had a major falling out in October of 1966. It was actually a public falling out or sharp disagreement. It was widely reported in the British newspapers at the time. And what happened was that in October of 1966, there was a meeting of something called the National Association of Evangelicals. Pastors and church leaders came from all over Britain. John Stott was the chair of that meeting. And Martin Lloyd-Jones gave an address during that meeting. In his address, Martin Lloyd-Jones told those who were gathered that if they were part of denominations that were drifting towards liberalism, they ought to leave immediately and form an independent church. Well, as the chair of that meeting, John Stott gave the concluding remarks, and he opposed that advice. Now, men like John Stott and J.I. Packer were just as concerned about the doctrinal drift and the liberalism that was creeping into denominations, but they thought the best way forward was to try to effect change from the inside. Martin Lloyd-Jones thought the best way to do it was from the just leave altogether. So who was right and who was wrong? I mean, it's actually, it's hard to say at the time. Now, there does come a point where you have to say, you know, this thing is rotten at the core. We all ought to get out of here. But some people might reach that that decision at a different point than others. And sometimes our disagreements are like that. And I'm saying this because we live in a polarized culture or climate. And sometimes we think we have to take sides on every single thing that comes up. Now, there are times where lines need to be drawn. There are things the Bible is crystal clear on. And I'm not saying there should be any compromise when it comes to those things. But there are also things where people can disagree. And the disagreement is not necessarily sinful. In those types of situations... What matters most is how we handle the conflict. <clears throat> Again, I, I've told you this before, but I used to do a lot of, uh, of work with couples preparing for marriage. Uh, some of you were actually in those marriage preparation classes I taught many years ago. 
But in addition to the classes, I would often meet one-on-one with couples who were preparing for marriage. And one thing we always talked about was how to resolve conflict or how to handle conflict. The inability to handle conflict peacefully is seen as one of the four horsemen that predicts divorce. So as part of our time together, I would usually, you know, as we're talking about conflict, I would usually say to the couple, well, why don't you tell me about your most recent conflict and how you worked through it? And every once in a while, there would be a couple who would say something like, oh, well, this is how we know our marriage is going to last. We've never even had a conflict. Now, I never like to be one to throw a wet blanket on people's enthusiasm, but I always felt it was my duty to say to them, you will, and you better know how to handle it when it comes. See, conflict is inevitable in marriage and in the church. Over the course of just the last few months, I've been involved in a few different situations where men who once labored side by side in the work of the gospel have had a sharp disagreement between them to the point where they went their separate ways. So this thing that happened between Paul and Barnabas is not sort of theoretical. It happened. It still happens. Conflict is inevitable even in The church, even among brothers and sisters who love the Lord with all their heart. Second thing we need to remember is that conflict is redeemable, especially in the church. So I want to get at this in two ways. I want you to see firstly that even in this passage that talks about the kind of conflict between Paul and Barnabas, even that kind of conflict can be used to further God's purposes. Look again at verses 39 to 41. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of of the Lord. So let me just show you this on uh, on the map. Okay, I meant to have my laser pointer up here. I forgot it. But Barnabas takes John Mark with him and he goes down to Cyprus, to the island of Cyprus, right? And what they do there is they do gospel work together. Barnabas and John Mark. Paul and Silas now go to Syria and Cilicia, and what they do is they do gospel work, and they strengthen the churches that are there. So in one sense, the result of this conflict is that the, the, the spread of the gospel is actually multiplied. Now, I am not saying anything like church splits are actually a good thing, and you know, we should have one here at Crossridge, right? So we can reach more people. What I am saying is that God can redeem even these types of conflicts, and He does, and history shows that. I I know that, that, and I, I understand that lots of people wonder, well, why are there so many different denominations of Christian churches? And I know that, that, that some churches are different from other churches, not so much in their theology or their doctrine, so much as their philosophy of ministry. And I understand it can seem like we are a divided people, but I also know that some people will be reached by churches that are vastly different from ours, right? We we would choose to do things differently. That's one of the ways God can redeem conflicts. But there's another aspect of redemption that we ought to think about when we think about this story. And we need to remember that this is not actually the end of this story. This is not the last time we hear about Paul and Barnabas or Paul and John Mark, for that matter. So at the end of the book of Colossians, Paul sends greetings 
to the Christians who are there along with some instructions. Here's what he says. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Now, most scholars think that Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians somewhere between A.D. 60 and A.D. 62. That would have been about 10 years after this parting with Barnabas. And when he writes to the church at Colossae, what he says to them, he commends Mark. You're to welcome him. He's the cousin of Barnabas, right? That's, he says that is a good thing. He didn't have a negative word to say about either of them. I, I think that's good for us to remember. But even more clear is what we read in the book of 2 Timothy. So if we're following our timeline... 2 Timothy is the last of the letters that Paul writes before he dies, shortly before he dies. And the letter of 2 Timothy was written somewhere around A.D. 64 and A.D. 65. And Paul was in prison as he wrote the letter of 2 Timothy. But, <clears throat> and some of the individuals who had been part of his ministry, part of his team, had abandoned him when things got difficult. But listen to what he says to Timothy. He says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Right? That is fascinating. What was this sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas about? Well, it was basically about the fact that Paul thought John Mark was useless to him in ministry. He's not taking him along. But now, as he's in prison, he describes him as useful or helpful in ministry. So what's changed? What caused the change? Well, maybe it was the fact that John Mark spent all that time with his cousin Barnabas, the son of encouragement. I mean, Mark did desert Paul and Barnabas in the middle of their first missionary journey. He was kind of useless at that point. But now when Paul is near the end of his life and he wants someone reliable around him, who does he ask for? He asks for John Mark. And I'm simply trying to point out that conflict is redeemable, especially in the church. Maybe a stronger way to say it would be like this. Conflict is redeemable, especially among the redeemed. And the reason I say that is because you can't really resolve conflict without forgiveness, and you can't really understand forgiveness or practice forgiveness without understanding that you have been forgiven. That is why the ethic of forgiveness in the New Testament is grounded in the fact that we have been forgiven by Christ. Listen to the way we're instructed about forgiveness in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read this. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 says something similar. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And that's why I say that conflict is redeemable, especially in the church, because we stand as those who have been forgiven by God. 
Now, I don't know what kind of conflict you might have in your life or in your past. I don't know what the status of all of your relationships are like. What I do know is this. Every single one of us who has embraced the gospel of Jesus is forgiven for every one of our trespasses, every one of our sins. And that means we ought to extend forgiveness for those who have offended us or hurt us in some way. And it's on the basis of that that we have relationship with one another. So I'll let the Lord speak to you about how you need to apply this in your own life, but let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for a reminder like this, one that's maybe surprising to us, this kind of conflict between Paul and Barnabas, and yet in your providence, you are able to work things out to such a way that the gospel continues to go forward, the church continues to grow, disciples are strengthened, and Lord, there's some of that in our lives. And there's also some aspects where maybe forgiveness needs to be extended and granted, relationships need to be repaired, And we pray for the humility and the grace to be able to do that as your people, forgiven by your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to spend.